Good morning, the people around you. Make sure you know their names. Yeah, pwede tumingin sa likod. Pwede maging friendly, Christians. Okay, go, go, and introduce yourself. Again, as you can see, our 11 a.m. is full. We just want to let you know that we have our 3 p.m. also and our 5 p.m. service. If you guys want to join that, uh, you can do so. If you want to help volunteer in one of our afternoon services, we'll be glad to uh, get you connected to our pastors in the afternoon uh, all right, uh, before we start, just uh, to warn you guys, I woke up with a stiff neck, so I'll just preach this way, huh? Kasi, kasi mami, do like this, do like that, so it's kind of hard, but uh, hopefully it loosens up a bit that God will heal me while I'm preaching. All right, uh, let's just bow down our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you would speak to us. I pray, God, that your word would do its work in us. Lord, I know that for the past two weeks, we've been talking about the conviction that creates the culture of the kingdom of God. I pray, Lord, that those conviction becomes real in our lives, not just things that we hear every Sunday, not just things that we know that we ought to do, but Lord, this would be something that would penetrate our soul, that would bring transformation. I pray, Lord, that we would come to a point even in our lives that uh, as we sometimes just focus on things we should stop doing and start doing and get tired doing those, I pray, Lord, that we would always go back to the conviction that we have that is in Christ. So I pray, Lord, this year, build godly convictions in us that would dictate our actions and our value system. Lord, even as we talk about the church, being a church in the city and loving this city, I pray, Lord, as we talk about another topic today that touches all of us here in this room, which is corruption, I pray, Holy Spirit, be the one to speak to us. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. All right. If you are new here, welcome. You come at the very right time because we're talking about corruption. Okay. And uh, just to give you a brief overview of our past two weeks, for us to understand where we're coming from uh, today is uh, this framework that I've been sharing for the past two weeks, which is Conviction drives culture that brings about constructs, okay? Your conviction, what you believe in as Christians, where we're coming from, our faith, our worldview, creates the culture that we would want as a city, as a church within the city, to love the city. The culture that we establish here, we embody outside into the world. Right? That creates, and now because of that culture, we create systems and structures that would drive home the culture and conviction that we have as a church. On our first week, we talk about our conviction messages, which is the covenant love of God, the Hesed, the steadfast love of the Lord, a love that never gives up, a love that's always there, giving in spite of our mistakes, in spite of us. Trying to break covenant, God is always looking after us. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. We talked about last week about justice. And when we're talking about justice, we're not just talking about justice of criminal punishment, but justice that is generous, that we make sure that we take care of the poor, the vulnerable, and the sick. And that should be the part of, of a lifestyle of a Christian. And we talk about the mercy that we need to give to the poor. Remember that the kingdom culture is built on these convictions. Of course, there are far more. We're just discussing a few of them. We're always coming from the love of God. Everything we do is based on God's love. Everything we do when we help the poor is not to make me feel good. Every time we foster or adopt, doesn't, it, it's, it doesn't mean because I don't have a baby and I want one. It's always with the steadfast love of the Lord. It's always for others. We talk about the Shema or something that the Israelites would memorize every morning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And then he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus adds in the New Testament the Shema and changes the lyrics by adding, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Imagine the power of Jesus changing a culture, a tradition that they would recite every morning to tell us that the way to love God is also by loving others. 
Kingdom culture is built on these convictions. That's why we do what we do. It's because of the love of God. And the kingdom of God culture dictates the systems and structures we implement to serve our convictions. Why do we go to the campuses? Why go to places where we know there will be no tithes and offering? Because it's a conviction that we have that we need to reach the next generation. It's coming from a conviction. Why do we help the poor? Why do we do real life? Why have a race? Why, why have 1,400 plus scholars across the Philippines? Because of the conviction that we have that every human is created in the image and likeness of God and that they need access to education to lift their families out of poverty. Every action we do is based on a conviction. It's not to make us look good. It's not to say, oh, look, oh, we're doing something to the poor. It's the Hesed love of God. That's why we've created systems and structures. So if you look at our church staff today, although we are quite few, we've actually asked what, uh, some of our staff to be a slasher. We tell them, okay, you do all these things, but because you are full-time staff and we need to take care of the scholars, this is going to be part of your job. And we will make sure you have a salary raise of 10 pesos. Okay, so there's no salary raise. It's a conviction that we have. We need to help the poor, and that's why we have scholars here in Makati as well. This is coming from that conviction. Today, as we look at corruption, I want to go more on a higher view of what God wants for our system by looking at Deuteronomy 16, and we'll look at a few verses on this chapter. If you have your Bibles with you, turn it there, and let's read. Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 16, verse 1, then we'll jump to verse 18 to 21. It says, Observe the month of Aviv and celebrate the Passover of the Lord your God, because in the month of Aviv, he brought you out of Egypt by night. Deuteronomy 16 started off with a conviction message. What was the message? Okay. He says, Observe the month and celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, has done to you because he has delivered you out of Egypt. This was a reminder of how God delivered Israel from the cruel injustices of the Egyptian rulers. Last week, we discussed about the difference between Israel's slavery and Egyptian slavery, right? And so, Lord was reminding them, please celebrate the Passover because it reminds you of where you came from. Tama-tama sa kondisyon ko ngayon, di ba? Ang taong hindi marunong lumingon, may steep neck, di ba? So, if you don't know how to... How do you say that in English? Anyway, ha? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Just translate okay. to some of you guys. But this is a reminder. This is where you came from. Look, I delivered you by doing the Passover and now celebrate it every year. As that reminder. Our conviction is God's heart is to deliver His people from the world's injustices. Okay. Now let me dwell here a bit. Okay. This means the reason why the Israelites celebrate the Passover is for them to understand this. The heart of God, every, when someone experiences injustice, my heart cannot take it. Because I believe God can deliver and the church should be, as followers of Christ, be part of the action of making sure that the injustices of the world don't happen in my own circle. I might not be able to solve the problems of Africa, but I can solve the problems of barangay, maybe Olympia, or a barangay in Tondo. In my world, I can do something about it and my heart cannot stand every time I see injustices in this world. How do you feel when you see street kids? Right? They knock on your door. They ring on your bell. They knock on your window too. Right? What do you do? When our heart becomes callous, I'm not saying give, because we know that would prolong the problem, but if I don't do anything about it, my heart becomes callous to the problem. Is there hope in your heart that God can deliver this nation from poverty? This was the conviction message, and that's why we do what we do. 
We could have said, oh, let's, let's stop campus ministry. It's too expensive, God. You keep asking for budgets. We could have stopped. We could have said, okay, let's stop real life because it's all about just giving away the tithes and the offering of the church. But no, it's the heart of God. And that's why we do missions. Again, it's all going out, all going out. Why? Because there's a conviction that God can deliver the world from its injustices. In Micah 6, 8, which is called the Micah Mandate, they, they were asking, so what should we do as people of God? And then the, the, the message was very simple. He says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. He has shown us, God has shown us as humans what is good. And what does the Lord require, not suggest? What does the Lord require of you? To act what? Justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Sometimes as evangelicals, we forget the first two. Takot okay? tayo. We're afraid. There's this premise that, oh, if I just help the poor, they, they don't get converted the money. And that's on you. Right? But remember, the Lord says the mandate for Christians is to what? Act justly. When I see injustice, I act upon it. I do something about it. It's reflected in my monthly budget and effort. And then he says to love mercy. And that's why we call it mercy ministries. When we go to the prisons and the correctional and we go to places where they cannot pay us back. It is to love mercy. The same mercy given to me every day, I now give to others. And he says to walk humbly with your God. You can't do one without doing both. You need to do all three. Okay, parents, just a tip. You want to raise kids who are not entitled? Practice my command in your family. Make sure they be aware of the injustices of the poor around them and that they would walk with God. If this generation lose awareness of the needs of mankind and of the needs of our nation, they would start to think everything is about me. And that's why I love the conviction message of God because it takes you out of your self-centeredness. It's not about me anymore. It's about the world that needs Christ. And how I can serve the people around me. Our understanding of justice and righteousness is rooted where? In the redemption we have experienced through Christ. Because of what Christ has done. How he has in a way overcome injustice by dying on the cross. My life is rooted on that. And therefore I go and do the things of God. Just as the Israelites were called to remember their deliverance, we too are called to remember God's justice and righteousness in our own lives. You see, with God, it's never a hopeless case. Sino sa inyo nasabi niyo na yan? Ay, wala nang pag-asa ang Pilipinas. Mag-repent kayo. Okay. Oh, yung, yung tinamaan, tamaan sana, okay? If you keep saying, oh, there's no more hope for our nation, you're, you're coming from a conviction that's very worldly. You don't believe God can move. You don't believe that the church can take action. We can do something about it. We can hope for redemption and deliverance as we live out and multiply kingdom culture in the world. Okay? Now I'll share to you two things lang, no? two things before I go to the message. How transformation is achieved. I, I shared this to the staff. Because I was saying, for culture to change, you've got to do something. You've got to be very deliberate. Right? The first thing is you have to understand, to change culture, you have to start small. Lead lang. It's like the kingdom of God. You start small, as mentioned in the parables of the kingdom. The parable, the kingdom of God is like a seed. The kingdom of God is like a yeast. The kingdom of God never moves like mega bonga. It's never that way. It's always the opposite. It's never about, okay, the way Philippines would experience revival is if we have a born-again president. That's not the way. It is so anti-kingdom. That's why when Jesus came here, what happened? 
He was born in a manger asleep on a hay, right? <laughs> Yung iba, ano, kanta yun, di ba? Away in a manger, okay? It's very counter-cultural. God does not need celebrities to change the world. He uses ordinary people like you and like me. People of no influence. God chose the foolish things of the world to what? Shame the wise. That's why even when you do good, the Bible says, don't tell your right hand what your left hand is doing. Why? That's how the kingdom of God operates. And then you'll start to see kingdom influence impact all around. You start small, yet in this small thing, what you do is you multiply the culture wherever you go. Right? You start small. Tahimik lang. Right? Who among you, you watch, you know, mga musicals or classical plays? Right? How do you clap? Huh? How, how? Ah, sample, sample, go. How do you clap? How do you clap? Yeah, bit. Yeah, very mahati, very sophisticated. Yeah. Di ba wala, wala sa play na, hoo, hoo. Okay, nobody does that, all right? You'll be taken out, right? So, ganyan lang. Right? Can you do it again? All right. All right. Now, everybody start doing it, okay? Everybody start doing it. All right? You see what's happening? What starts small later on when multiplied all across starts to change the culture of the room. That's how you transform using the kingdom principles. You always start small and then you multiply the model. And that's why when you study history, Christians have changed history until they have power and they start to make things big and official rather than what? Small impact all across multiply. Deuteronomy 16 verse 18 it says, Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town the Lord your God is giving you, and they shall judge the people fairly. Now, here's what I love about God's system, because God's system commands the people to appoint judges who would administer justice. The structure should be based on the culture and conviction God has set. So in a very democratic country, if you translate this to Filipino, what God is saying, make sure to vote people who would administer what? Justice. Somebody who will help you, not just promise you or dance in the platform. Somebody who would actually help you administer justice in this nation. I remember being part of a podcast and then there's this guest who was a senator. And he had a question. He said, because I'm, I've been, he said, I've been reading my Bible and when I was in Joseph, he said, I couldn't explain it to my kid because it was the sin of Pharaoh. But how come the whole nation was punished for the sin of the leader? Good question, right? It was Pharaoh. Why, why, why would all of us experience the ten uh, plagues of Egypt? He says, I can't understand. I can't explain it to my kid. I hope he's a good now. Because, and here's the answer, as leaders of the land, that's how much responsibility you have. The leaders we choose, okay, would in a way affect all of us because we chose that leader. And so when God brings judgment to the leader, all of us are affected. Why? Because we appointed the leaders. Remember when Israel wanted a king? Give us a king like all the other nations. God was saying, why would you want a king? I'm a just king. I'm a loving king. I'm a benevolent king. No, but our neighbors had kings. We want to have one. Oh, but he will bring, give you taxes. Yeah, we want one. Make it 30%. <laughs> He'll get your lands. He'll do everything that government is doing now. God knows. But they said, no, we want one. And that's why God was saying, appoint people who would administer justice. Remember, everything rises and falls on leadership. You choose not your own adventure, you choose your leader who will lead us. And I'm not just talking about nation. I'm talking about your work. If you start a business, who's the supervisor? Who'll be the lead? In everything that we do, everything rises and falls on leadership. 
And that's why that position is sacred. Because it's either he would bring us to flourishing or he'll bring us somewhere else. The leaders we choose would directly correlate to how our daily lives would look. That's why you choose wisely. Who's my leader? All right. In our system, majority wins, right? So that's our leader. We chose that. Even if you did not vote for them, we chose them. Because that's our system. All right? Verse 19. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Okay. Now, when you look at Deuteronomy 16, you have to remember this. No? The context is always, there's a power dynamic. Somebody wants to pervert justice. Who perverts justice? The one in power or the one who has no power? The one who has power. This was a command to the leaders, do not pervert justice. Don't twist the law for your benefit. Because you have the power. The people don't have the power. Okay. So don't pervert it or don't show partiality because most of the time we show partiality to whom? To whom we would receive favor from. And that's why I would now administer justice to those who I like rather than to those who actually need it. Don't accept a bribe. Why? Because once you start to accept a bribe, it what? It blinds your eyes. That's what greed does. It blinds us. Right? And then the words, it would twist the words of the innocent to make it look like I'm still doing my job even though I'm corrupt. I remember when I was still young and working in Divisoria, we would always see this because our Manila mayor at the time would always say this. The law applies to all, otherwise none at all. Very true. Right? That's why there's the law. The law is for the rich. The law is for the poor. And it, it's, in its spirit, it's what? The justice of God. The law applies to all, otherwise none at all. That's why the justice statue is blind because... It should not look whether you're rich or poor or what color of the skin you have. It is justice for all. That's the spirit that's coming from a godly conviction. Yet, how come we experience something very, very different? It says, do not accept a bribe for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise. To take a bribe means to accept payment, to render a decision based on personal profit. When justice is for sale, problem is that there is no justice because I can pay for it. That's taking a bribe. The one in control, when he takes a bribe and you participate in it, it means justice is actually for sale. Paano ka nauna? Kapila kami dito. Ah, nabigyan ng regalo then there's no more justice. And I'm just talking about falling in line. When justice is for sale, there's no justice. And it's very scary. Because it starts from the small, trivial things. And then later on, to bigger things. And that's why they say, our nation has a problem, has a systematic corruption problem. It's in the system already. So that's why they computerize. So now it's a systemic computerized corruption. All right? Because it's in the system. The virus is inside. How do I change it? You want to know how to change it? You want to know how to change? Vote me next year. I'm running for the Jokoli, Jokoli. I'm running at Race for Life, okay? Greed and love of money through bribery blinds us from rational and righteous thinking and living. You know, we, we've been on the receiving end of this, of somebody asking bribe from us. It is so hard. Why? Because we can't do anything. Grabe, sobrang hirap sa totoong mundo. When you get out of the bubble, you start to say, oh, you mean if I don't give you, you'll close my store? I'm just doing what's right. Imagine the struggle that people go through. 
And that's why this is a very complex issue. It's systemic in nature, and that's why it's already in the construct, and that's why I want us to go back to conviction. Because I might not be able to change the construct, because it changes every four years with a different precedent, but the conviction, or six years, sorry, six years, right? And that's why it is so hard, because you keep changing it, and we're just focusing on the construct, but we've never talked about conviction. We've never talked about culture. And when it comes to kingdom culture, a lot of Christians don't like it. Because it's about others and not me. It takes a lot of repentance, of awareness. It takes a lot of the Holy Spirit work in our lives. I'll give you an example of what we see almost every day in the news or social media. Today, it has always been about legal issues. Legal by that, it was ne we never talk about ethics anymore or moral ethics. It's always, oh, I did nothing wrong. I'm okay. You just watch the Senate hearing in aid of uh, publicity, ah, le legislation, okay? You know, you would see that and you, okay, what's the topic again? Okay, one hot topic is Okay, I'll end here. Okay, we'll not just post that. Okay, lang. A uh, hot topic would be citizenship of mayor. Okay. Wait, is that really the topic? Because that's a legal issue that I know is to be addressed and it's easily addressed. Right? But what's the real topic that's never mentioned? The thousands of people who were trafficked was never mentioned. How the poor become poor and are abused in the workplace because of the construct that happened because of the of this mayor. So all we want is to see the face of the mayor, know her love life, you know, and what happened next, how many more connections, but the voiceless and the vulnerable are never featured or mentioned. It's all legal. So now somebody's invited as a resource in Senate, and all he talks about is legality. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Of course he did nothing wrong. He just did something unethical. But it's never mentioned. Why? Because our system is based on a, co uh, our construct is based on a conviction that money is everything. That money is God and it's power. It's all about power. And that's why we never treat it. We just want, ah, sana makulong, sana makulong. And the next one comes along. And another one comes along. And the next election, this will be the same problem. And that's why we get all emotional every election. Why? Because the same human beings would make promises that would tickle our hearts and our ears. And we're thinking, this is it, this is it. If my chicken will win, everything will change. Would it? I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I'm trying to say until you go back as Christians and look back at conviction and culture, things will be the same. So the, ah, illegal na mga pogo eh. Stop na natin mga pogo. Teka lang, lahat ng nascam, babalik ba natin pera? What's gonna happen? Oh, we, we never talk about that. It's always the voiceless and the poor that's affected. And then we make an entertainment out of the people in power, thinking that would solve the problem. But the ethics behind it, it's all wrong. It's messed up. Another construct that we have. Okay, pag 49, ganitong million ba yun? Or ano, 49 million, di pa siya plunder. Pag 50, plunder na. So all corruption ends at 49 million. I won't go 50. Why? That's plunder. Have we talked about what 49 million times how many multiply? That's how you change the culture. Small, small. 49, 49, 49, 49, 49. 49. Right? No, we don't talk about it. Sana ma-plunder. No, hindi nga pasok sa plunder. Sayang. 
Oh, but there's 49 million that we have to talk about that was supposed to be for our structures of city, for the poor, for DSWD, for DPWH, all going to where? But we don't talk about it. Why? It's not sensational. Boring eh. Mas masarap pag ma-feature. Sa labas ng mga vloggers. Pasikatin. And nothing happens. We actually feed on the same what? Parang showbiz na lang siya. Entertainment na lang. Without change. Rather than featuring narratives and stories of people who help the nation, we always go and look at what? Systemic corruption. And just say, oh, it's there, oh, it's there. Oh, oh, oh it's fun, oh. oh, it's making us laugh. It's good entertainment. And that's why there's never change. Remember, corruption would always breed corruption. And that's a problem. When it's systemic, then everybody cor becomes corrupt. And that's why within our system, it's also very fun. You have an elected official who promises to fight graft and corruption, but then you need to have an office, a prosecutor, who will prosecute the person who promised not to be corrupt. But sometimes the office of the prosecutor also needs a prosecutor, right? It never ends. When will the safeguard end? With our human sinful nature as we've studied every week already, you know it will never end. Look why it's so important to appoint judges according to Deuteronomy 16. These are the best and worst ranked countries for corruption. If you would see GDP, now there's no algorithm naman talaga of all perfect algorithm of things. But if you look at it, the most corrupt nations are the poorest of the poor. Yet, that's where a lot of money are being corrupted. While the rich and flourishing nation continues to fight corruption. Of course, the study said that you can never totally eradicate corruption according to data. Even with Denmark, there is still corruption. Yet, if you see the more leaders where there's a culture that corruption is evil, they would create systems and structures to make sure that that won't happen. If there's injustices in the world, the systems would now, when you look at the systems, you will see, oh, they're coming from a conviction that you can. This week, we were just with a minister in Singapore, and she was saying this. She was saying that every time somebody gives her a gift, it doesn't pass through her hands. And they would always say, the staff would say, we will give this to the poor. It just goes like that. I don't want to do anything about it. I don't need any favors. It just goes through. He says, that's why the whole system of Singapore, and that's why it's high, number three, in one of the best countries, is because of the system. You can't accept. It, it doesn't even pass through. It goes to the staff, and the staff just... There's a system that it goes to the poor. It goes to organizations that need help. It's a conviction coming from them, and that's why they created the system. There will be no corruption. James 5.4 Behold, the wages of the laborers who move your field, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Here's what I'm saying. Now, you look at all the, no, is there a solution to systemic corruption? Actually, there is. Okay. But the solution you might not like because it's not political in nature. The Bible says that if there's injustice and the laborers cry, it's not the union who will hear it. It's the ears of the Lord. And if it's the Lord who moves, you better watch out. Because it has reached the ears of the Lord. And if you look at Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you'll see what God does to injustice. The leaders we choose will directly correlate to how our daily lives will look. That's why, as what I said earlier, we choose wisely. Now when you take a bribe, remember this. 
or when you participate in one, remember this, because they will always say, nobody will know. I disagree. There's actually three people who will know. Every time there's illegal things happening and corruption happening, there is no such thing as nobody will know or it will never come up. It's all, it won't show. Somebody will always know. Okay, number one is that you will know. You will know. Number two is I will know. You go up You will know, I will know. And the third one is God will know. Okay. Pag si Manny Pacquiao pa, Manny knows. Okay, so, you know, you know. Okay. The requirement for choosing the people who would lead and administer justice, look at this, is consistent with God's overarching desire that each Israelite love their neighbor as themselves. It goes back to the creed that Jesus made. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Look at verse 1. He says, follow justice and justice alone. So that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. This is a double emphasis. That's why it's written this way. Justice and justice. It means this is very important. You have to take note. If God is talking to you, ito yung sabi ni Lord, tumingin ka sa mata ko. Look at, look at me there. But because they don't say that, they just actually use in their literature two words, again, as an emphasis. Follow justice and justice alone. It's all about the justice of God. You destroy the justice of God, who's your enemy? God. So that you may live and possess the land your God is giving you. Dispensing justice is a top priority. Now, how can we as Christians give generous justice in our world? Remember this. Since, sino ba dito 1970s pa kayo? Or 60s? Meron ba? 1960s, 70s? Alright. May, may mga honest Christians tayo dito, okay? We all know since the 60s, 70s, corruption has been there. Am I right? Tama, di ba? It's been there. Question. So more than ilang years na, no? Tagal na. How many presidents already? Question. Has it stopped the church really from making a difference in the world? Of being salt and light and practicing my mandate to love justice, to move in mercy, to walk humbly before God? While doing this, it's like at first, parang, Lord, teka lang, sobrang systemic na ng corruption. But here's what I realized. And here's what scripture is trying to point to us. It should not stop you. It should not stop us from doing what is righteous and just. That in my own world, I keep doing it. I keep doing it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's why it's a daily prayer. Why? It's going to be a daily struggle. You go out and you will see injustices. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, here's another corruption. But Lord, I cannot control that. I can control my business. Your kingdom come, your will be done on my business, on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, here's a chance not to pay taxes since I feel like it goes naman to the pockets. Don't do that. Pay your taxes and pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let them face God's judgment, not you. Be part of the change. Because the church has never stopped. Even the world system is corrupt. The church continues to help. Okay. That's why I love uh, when, when I was talking to uh, John and Krina. Because when they started Generations Home, the whole system, just to adopt and foster in the Philippines, takes like, oh, takes till rapture, okay, sometimes. Okay. And so you've got to have organizations that are non-NGOs to go and create a kingdom culture with its systems and structures that would bring kids to families. 
Because if it's put in the system, it's too hard. It's sad, but it's the reality. So rather than say, ah, grabe naman ang system natin. No, somebody made a decision to do something about it. Was it hard? Of course. Do you go against the flow? Yes. But there are so many Christian organizations out there that are doing just that. When we talk about real life, because when they ask me, what, what, what foundations do you help out? Real life is one of them. We give a lot. You know why? Because of its in, uh, stringent policies. Sometimes I actually get mad with their stringent policies. But then when I give, I am secure. That when I give here, it goes to the scholars. Psychography. To have one thousand, almost one in five scholars, which is, I think, one of the largest local church-based scholarship program ever in the Philippines, to have such system is like, wow, how could we do this? It's really the collaboration, but it's coming from a conviction that we need to help the poor and the money should go where it should be going, not just on systems and structures, but the scholars. Corruption should never stop us. In fact, that's the solution. As Christians, I keep doing what I'm called to do. It's a mandate that I have. I can't change. I can't run. For sure, I will not win. All right. Okay, joke, okay, joke. No. Something I will not do, by the way. Guys, I don't know if you can do it. Si ano si who will run? Willy Chua na lang para mokang doctor. Doc Willie. Okay, parang ganun. <laughs> Pwede ah. Doc Willie. Konsihal ng Makati. Okay. <laughs> Randall, di rin pwede. Hindi sumasayaw yan. Okay. Verse 21 to 22. Do not set up. Look how it ends. I, I love how the, the chapter ends. Verse 21, 22. Do not set up any wooden asherah pole beside the altar you build to the Lord your God. And do not erect a sacred stone for these the Lord your God hates. Why after talking about all this? Remember the Passover. You know, just make sure to do all this. Appoint judges. Oh, by the way, don't worship idols. Huh? That's the end. Why? Why is it there? Remember this. There's a great disparity, uh, disparity between pagan culture where we make our gods and God's kingdom culture. Anlayo. It's just two different software that you put. Right? Paganism fundamentally revolves around each person seeking to have their appetites and desires fulfilled at the expense of another. So paganism is, it's for me. I'm my own God. Pagan. I want rain. I dance, the rain dance, okay? Just bless me. Okay. I need blessings, I bow down. It's never for others. The whole pagan culture is about me thriving in the expense of others. God was saying, don't. That's why, if you look at the Old Testament now, it will make sense. Bakit ganun si Lord sabi, do not intermarry, or do not do this, or do not do that. Uh, wipe them. Why? Because the system is so different that it would bring about destruction in the long run and will be more painful for the people. I'll give you an example of where it was coming from in Deuteronomy 16. Okay? There were temple prostitutes. Women were to be in temples and the priests and its members could have sex with women. Imagine, in the temple. Because in the pagan mindset, in Egypt, Humans are not dignified and respected. So you can just do that. That's why in the Old Testament, it's the same. In the church in Corinth, almost the same. For them, humans are like, ah, you can use them. That's the whole system. It is so against the conviction of God of his said that he's saying, you can't have that system. You can't intermarry with a spouse who thinks that humans are not created in the image and likeness of God or else your kids and your kids and kids and grandkids would be abused by the system. Because it's coming from a very evil conviction. Humans are just like insects. And that's why there's worship 
of children and kids. They burn them to please the gods. You gotta say, no, you can't do that. That's why we don't believe in abortion. Why? Kids are voiceless. They have no vote. And that's why you can't. Because the conviction is the steadfast love of the Lord. This child has hope. Well, what's the solution? generations home. And that's why you are here. Because some of you I will require to adopt. No, no, joke lang. Okay? That's why we're here. We're the family of God. We bring people into flourishing and not just waste their lives. If you look at the New Testament, look, 1 Timothy 5.3, the system of God. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. No husband, son, persecuted. And if you're a widow, the only job you can have might be prostitution. And so they made a law among the Israelites take care of the widows. No widow should be begging. Guys, if you need to create a system every day, the widow gets food, the widow take, is taken care of, do it. No orphans in the land. Somebody has to take it. You, you see the heart of God? Grab it, no? Imagine how far we have... We think now, as Christians, when there's crisis, wala na. Kaya open hand, open heart. It needs to be soft again. God has to do something about this. And that's why trafficking continues right before our eyes. Just go to publish up. You'll see. It's sometimes, oh, Lord, can someone, can some, who's doing, you yeah. know? The culture of wickedness and corruption did not stop the disciples from living out kingdom culture and making a difference in the world. I want you to think about that. No matter how corrupt, how evil governments would be, or how inept some of the systems are, it has never stopped. Christians living out kingdom culture. Because the government is not the solution. You all know that. Right? That's why the church is a city within the city. I remember hearing the story when I was young of this boy who was in the beach. And there were a lot of starfish. And he started getting one and started throwing it to the sea. He gets another one. But there were thousands. And an old man was saying, boy, you're wasting your time. It's not going to do anything. You won't affect change. The boy says, yeah, I might not be able to do it for everyone. Then he picks another one. And he says, but I can do it for this one. And picks another one. And for this one. And for this one. Sure ako, Victory Makati will never solve poverty in the whole Philippines. But I look at a, a thousand plus Christians coming together and collaborating, united with the Hesed love of God. Oh, we can do a lot of things. Maybe not for the government, but for one kid. Or a poor family that now is lifted up because somebody sponsored a scholarship and now they have hope, a door has been opened for a better future and for another one. And for our campus ministries to go to different schools, another one. The goal is not just to say, I wanted a big band. No, start small. Tammy and I are sure we can never solve the orphan crisis on our own. But for one girl, we love. And we're maxed, we're actually full. Right? But we know we change a life. Not every life, but one life. A starfish. 
we change one thing. If all of us start thinking this way, we change how many thousands of lives. And I hope this is not like emotional shinders list. Oh, what if I no, no, it's not. It's your understanding you can make a difference with kingdom culture. You're saying, Oh, I've been touched by the love of God. What more? If I have a room to spare, why not? If I have extra money, why not? Why not collaborate? So many things we can do for the kingdom of God. I love how the ministry of Jesus ended. Because one of the greatest injustices that ever happened was Jesus being declared guilty for doing nothing. Imagine. If there's somebody who knows injustice, it's Jesus. Releasing Barabbas, a murderer, so that Jesus might be crucified. Imagine. Pontius Pilate was saying, I'm washing my hands. And, and sometimes, you know, you look at that picture. I mean, that's a picture of the church, actually. We're washing our hands. That's not my kid. That's not my problem. We wash our hands. And we're thinking, si Lord na bahala. No, the Lord was saying, I suffered injustice. This is Deuteronomy 16. Celebrate the month of Aviv. The Passover. When I delivered you. Because you are about to deliver people out from the injustices of the world. This is not about you. This is about His kingdom. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Look at this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's why the cross is the great exchange. He left everything to be like us, so that you, through his poverty, you might experience life. We're not talking about money. We're talking about life. The John 10, 10 flourishing kind of life, the abundant life in Christ was able to happen because of the injustice done to Jesus. He turned it around. I want to end with a few verses prior to that text. And he says there, Now friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia. What happened in Macedonia? Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. And what was their color? They were what? Incredibly happy, though desperately poor. Sino sa inyo desperately poor, but incredibly happy? The pressure triggered something totally unexpected. An outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. I'll tell you the picture, guys. They were so poor, they went to MDR with no slippers, and they're bringing plastics, maybe of mongo, of potato, in a shirt that was donated to them. And they're saying, Pastor, who was wearing a 1,000 peso uh, hoodie and a nice jeans. And he said, Pastor, Pastor, please get this. And then the pastor said, oh, no, 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 no. We're actually raising funds for you guys. No, Pastor, please. Please, we have to give. We have to give. We're so happy. We have to give, Pastor. No, no, you don't understand. You're so poor. We're poor. But somebody needs this. This was 2 Corinthians 8. The whole conviction of the church was, I'm not poor. I'm blessed. I need to do something about it. It needs to affect me. It needs to change me. 
It means there's some giving up that I have to do, whether it's a vacation or a Starbucks coffee, so that somebody might be touched by the generous justice of God. They were pleading. Imagine, poor people pleading. Most poor people plead for relief. These guys were pleading to help. And they were desperately poor. Why? For the other poor Christians. That was, this was totally spontaneous. Entirely their own idea and caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. The other giving simply flowed out of what? The purposes of God working in their lives. When God created us, part of the software was to be the most generous people in the world because freely we have received, freely I now give. I receive the unconditional agape love of God. Freely now, I give. I've received so much blessings in my life. I now freely give. Not announcing to the world. But me understanding the injustice that happened to Christ was the way for justice to be served so that I might be rich when Jesus became poor, dying on the cross for my sin. That's what prompted us to ask Titus to bring the relief offering to your attention so that what was so well begun could be finished up. You do so well in many things. You trust God. You're articulate. You're insightful. You're passionate. You love us. Now, look, Paul is saying, oh, you're so talented. You're like the Makati people. Articulate. Insightful. A lot of opportunities. You're passionate. You love us. But do your best in this too. Giving even when it hurts. I'm not trying to order you against your will. I love what Paul was saying. Oh, this is not required. Guys, we will not require you. There will be no record of this. In fact, if you want to give without any names, it's okay. I don't want to give special treatment just because you gave. We're all equal. But by bringing in the Macedonian enthusiasm as a stimulus to your love, I'm hoping to bring the best out of you. When you move in generous justice and radical generosity, it brings out the best in you. You're familiar with the generosity of our master Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor and we became rich. Christian ka ngayon. Tayo, Christian tayo ngayon. Because somebody who was in heaven, who was so rich, came down so that through his poverty, I might become rich. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray these words, the letter, convict us, our souls, to say, I need to do something about this. Everyone, from the youngest here, if you're seven, eight years old, to the oldest one here, what can I do? Lord, I understand, he said, the steadfast love of the Lord. What is my action? We will all have different applications of this. But I believe as we embrace this, we will impact the city. Sabi ko I love the city is not a program. I hope it does not become one. That's what I'm scared of. You love the city program. I hope it's culture. When you talk about loving the city, you're talking about every Christian empowered to do generous justice to the world, to people who can't pay you back. I want to call on my friend, Jonathan, who was responsible for us uh, fostering. But I'm telling you, our fostering journey changed us made our hearts softer, made us see things differently. 
And uh, they have their own story of how they were able to do this. It's not easy going for them up until now. And so I go, Jonathan, member, we should be supporting you the most. If there's, you know, hopefully, talaga, Victory Mahati will have one of those cultures that when you see somebody and you see, oh, uh, we adopted, oh, we fostered, oh, parang lahat tayo may, may baby galore tayo dito, all right? Uh, our kids' church would hopefully be at par with our adult church because of all the kids that are coming here. Every 3 p.m., there's a group of people here who would bring around 20 street kids, dress them up so that they could enter MDR and show them, guys, there's a better life than the streets. They come here every week. They raise their own funds. But these kids are encountering God. We're teaching them how to brush their teeth, how to take a bath, and sometimes make up. You know? um, but these kids are, are being touched by regular members of our church. It's not even a ministry. It's just saying, let's do something about the street kids. But I want uh, John to just share a bit about Generations Home. They have a booth outside. So if you want just an awareness, not even, oh, we saw foster. No, just even an awareness of the crisis that we have and what we can do as a church, please uh, go to our booth later. But I'll ask John to share something about Generations Home. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. And uh, this story really began in, in church community. And it began in pain uh, when my wife and I lost uh, our, our baby. Uh, my wife gave birth to a stillborn child when the child was, when my wife was six months pregnant. And some of you have heard this story, but it took that experience, shifted, and awakened the conviction inside of us. Um, and I really believe that this is not something that um, is another task. I uh, really hope that this is some, a conviction that we can carry um, as, a, as a family. As, as, as sons and daughters of God, we're called to sacred work. We're called to something, we're called to do justice. And justice, there's retributive justice where we, we, bring, we bring criminals to justice, but there's restorative justice, putting things back the way God designed it. And we believe at Generations Home that God designed the two million 1.8 million to 2 million orphans, the 5 to 8 million kids, and that's an entire nation. The, the population of Singapore is 6 million. When I share this there, they're like, imagine the whole nation of orphan and vulnerable children who need families. We believe these children belong in families. Period. They belong in families, not institutions. There are, about, there are 160,000 of them now in orphanages and in institutions. But we all know that the studies are, are mounting that it, it becomes a cycle. It's not good for them to grow up in an institution. The, the likelihood of, of, of sex trafficking, the likelihood of suicide, the likelihood of, of, uh, of criminal uh, offenses from these kids who grow up in institutions goes up exponentially. They belong in families, and this, we believe, is, it's our duty as sons and daughters of God. Not as victory, not as generations home. As sons and daughters of God, this is who we are. This is who we are. <laughs> there's something missing if we're not doing something about this. And I, I believe there's, there could be a tug in some of your hearts, hopefully all of us. May, I, we're not all called to adopt. We're all not called to foster, but we're all called to respond. One response. Imagine we have one, I'll tell you our four programs. We have one is orphan prevention. We help pregnant women who are in crisis. A 16-year-old, a 14-year-old, we had two women last night, yesterday, who we met. Two 14-year-old women who gave birth. Girls, they're not even women yet. They gave birth. And one is... Struggling because every time she breastfeeds, she gets sick because her body was not meant to do that at 14 years old. So we do a program for these women to prevent orphanhood. And sometimes all it takes is really just a few thousand pesos. And this woman will decide not to sell her baby and will decide to keep her. 
and we preserve a family. And the impact to us is maybe small, relatively. The impact to this woman, to this girl, is generational. It mattered to that one starfish. It's generational. You guys have to get this. Small act is what we like to say, small act, big impact. We're all called to respond. Our other program is um, adoption and foster care. Just like we encouraged Pastor Dennis, it mattered to that one girl. My oldest daughter, her name is Chloe, Chloe Murrell. She's six years old now, and she could have easily gone into trafficking. But we changed the course of the entire generation. She was headed in one direction, one yes, his yes, and some of you already in this church said one yes impacted the entire course, the entire trajectory of this child's generation. Adoption, foster care, that's our, our second program. Our next program is called Ad Advocacy. There's a huge, there's a terrible stigma around adoption and foster care in the Philippines. So we have to advocate. We're changing culture. Like Pastor Dennis said, it starts with us, our conviction, and then we're championing, changing the culture. The ampon kalang mentality in the Philippines needs to go away. Adoption is beautiful. It's beautiful. When you say yes to a child, it's beautiful. That's what God did for us. And our final program is called Youth. Uh, our youth, we don't have a formal name for it yet, but it's a youth program where all these children institutions, the 160,000 children who are in orphanages and institutions, the likelihood of them going back to the streets is so high. I don't have a stat for that. But what we do is we help them get on their feet, similar to what Real Life is doing. I've heard stories of children who come out of orphanages. They don't even know how to cross the street. They're 18 years old. They have no one to call to when they're, if they get sick. Who's going to come to them? They have no family. They're doomed to fail. So this is our, our, our program that we're so excited about. And through your prayers and your support, we've been able to, to uh, launch um, a family center in Santa Rosa. But we can't do this on our own. We don't know if we'll ever solve the orphan crisis, but we'll do what we can because this is who we are. Yeah. Thank you. Again, if, if you guys want, just even for awareness, they have a booth outside. And, uh, you know, let's do something about it. Uh, we also have our booth for real life. It's not to register for the race already. It's closed. Uh, but if you want to so support scholars also on a monthly basis, please, please, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to expand our Makati scholars, but we need funds also for our real life scholars. Now, so we're getting only what we can for now. But I believe if some of you, God tugs your heart also, this is something that would change uh, families. You touch a scholar, you touch a family already, right? Uh, and the training and the discipleship that happens through the local church is like, it's very different from outside constructs and systems. Now it's, it's very local church based. And so that's why I highly encourage you to really pray about uh, supporting our uh, real life scholars. All right, can we just all stand up and we're going to pray. I want you to know that all of us, we have problems. We all do. Right? But there's a bigger task and a problem and crisis that we can do as Christians. That's why we have God with us. And that's why we support as a local church. Right? And um, there's so many ways to do this. So do pray about it. Let's, let's bow down our heads. Father, we thank you. Lord, I pray for godly convictions to be birthed in us, God. Conviction that every human is created in the image and likeness of God with a potential to change the world, to love, and to make a difference. That includes us, that includes orphans, people who are trafficked, the poor, the vulnerable, the widows, people in prison, people whom society has given up. Lord, you've called the church to do its part. Where nobody wants to go, God, I pray, Lord, teach us to walk in those paths. 
the narrow road that would lead to not just our own lives experiencing life, but Lord, life being experienced by others. Teach us to be selfless, God. Teach us to look beyond our needs. Give us the heart of God. Give us your heart. Soften our hearts. Lord, this year, let there be a transformation. I know it's going to be a journey of transformation. Let there be transformation this year. A softening of the heart. Let generous justice be lived out in our church family. Lord, we thank you. Lord, bless. Bless each and everyone here as we bless others. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say, Amen, Amen.